Gure lehen da biziko gonbidatua Colin Williams da. Cardiff eta Cambridgeko unibertsitatetatik datorkiguna. Galestarra da. Eta galestarra erabiltzeko urbilpen eredu desberdina probatzen ari dira bertan. Ekimen berriak jarri dituzte abian, eta hango esperientzia geurea ekartzeko modukoa dela iruditu zaigu. E, Colin Williams, Cardiff Universitateko Wells Eskolseko soziolinguistikako ikerketa irakaslea izan zen, eta gaur egun ohorezko irakaslea da bertan. Horrez gain, St. Edmund Collegeko Von Hagen Institutoko kide, kidea ere, kidea espezializatua da. Bere ibilbide profesionalean makina bat unibertsitatetatik pasa izan da, eta bestalde, Ipar Amerikako eta Europako gobernuen aholkularia izan da, gutxiengoen gaietan. Gaur egun, Galesko gobernuaren aholkularia da, izkuntza ofizialaren estrategian. Eskatu diogu hango berri zuzena emateko, eta besteri gabeari emango diotitza, mese dezar dezagun, txalo ero batez. Colin Williams. Thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you. Bod y dag efeithion, cyfarchion o Gymru, rwy'n hynod o falch i fod yma ac yn derbyn yr anrhydedd o'ch anerchu. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to be here to learn of your experiences and to share something of what we've done in Wales towards the same overall project of increasing language use. I'm sure much of what I have to say will be familiar to you, because although I'm going to be talking about Wales, good ideas transfer, and we have very many similar initiatives that you have. And in one sense, the two fundamental questions I want to start with are what are your real expectations deep down regarding this program in the long run, not just for the next year, but for the long term? And do you have faith that it will work? Now, I know as you as activists and as government people have faith in your own work, but do you have faith in the community that it will take up the ideas that the initiatives you have and embed them into themselves, not just behave as you wish them to behave for the short term, but to internalize the deep, profound behavioral changes that you are seeking to achieve. That's the real test of your initiative. These are your aims in English. You don't need to be told those. You know them very well. But the biggest and most progressive part of this is synergy. I've understood that a number of different agencies, government departments, civil action groups, social activists, have come together, and together that synergy can create new realities. So to me, encouragement, working together, cooperation, addressing honestly the data, the evidence, and the difficulties that you face, but seeking collective answers that will help you overcome them. In Wales, the basic foundation of language use is the education system. It used to be said that the family and the community transmitted language. That may have been true up until the 1960s, 1970s. But in Wales, both the family and the community are weakening in terms of their language transmission. And so the education system becomes paramount in developing new language skills, in introducing new speakers into the language, and as the bedrock for all the promotion efforts to increase skills. One of the things that we have in Wales is a gradualist, evolutionary approach to language planning, based in part on bottom-up organic initiatives, much as what you have here, but also a legislative framework, a British legislative framework, which gives official status to Welsh, co-equality of Welsh and English in Wales, and the first two fundamental acts which legitimise the incorporation of Welsh into public administration, into bilingual education, into hospital use, etc., were the 1969 Welsh Language Act, which was the first time since 1536 
that the Welsh language was given any status in Britain. In 1536, the Tudor monarchy abolished the Welsh language in officialdom. It, it outlawed it. And so for four centuries, there was no official recognition for the use of Welsh except in the churches, in the chapels and the churches. So in 1969, the UK Parliament, the British Parliament, passed an act which gave legitimacy to the efforts to reintroduce Welsh into public life. It had always been in private life, in family life, in farms, and in small businesses. But in public life, it was only in 1969 that Welsh was given any status whatsoever. And then a second act in 1993, the Welsh Language Act, again a British Parliamentary Act, established a Welsh Language Board. So for the first time ever, we had a government department, an agency of government, which promoted the use of Welsh. And it established a new set of language schemes by which local authorities, hospitals, universities could negotiate with the language board under what conditions and how they were going to use Welsh as a matter of public service delivery and customer rights. To date, there are 551 language schemes which cover almost the entire spectrum of public life. And then following devolution in 1999 to Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, the Welsh Assembly, the Welsh Parliament, took over responsibility for language policy in Wales. And in 2011, that Parliament was changed from a Parliament which could discuss secondary legislation, the colour of custard in Welsh schools, nothing particularly important, to primary legislation. The British government devolved 20 fields of public policy from Westminster to Cardiff. And one of the most important fields that it devolved was the Welsh language. So for the first time in our history, we have a parliament which can legislate in Wales for the Welsh language. And its first measure, 2011, was a Welsh language act, a Welsh language measure, and it did two things. It gave official status to Welsh in all domains of Welsh life, for the first time ever. It replaced the Welsh Language Board, which was an arm's length agency, and took language policy in-house. So for the first time ever in our history, the government itself, its own departments, are responsible for language policy. And then to regulate that policy, it established a Welsh Language Commissioner, a very powerful ombudsman person with an office of about 48 staff, who could regulate the use of Welsh in public life according to a system known as language standards, which are stronger than schemes and are meant to gradually spread bilingual practice to all parts of public, private and voluntary life in Wales. The government is very committed to the promotion of Welsh, as are all the political parties. So you could argue that in our first time in our history, we now are a bilingual polity, a bilingual local state. These are the enactments, just to give you some context. So what we have to date is two generations of campaign-led development on language issues, a top-down government program for language promotion, Legislative protection for the language, which is robust and consistent, and a regulatory authority in the form of a language commissioner to undergird all these changes in statute, by law, with sanctions, where applied to investigations of non-compliance or to breaking the law. We now have a suite of language duties. They're not quite language rights because they've not been enforced in courts of law. They're language duties and obligations. So it's one level below an absolute language right, which we're still working on. So, what I want to talk about is, if we have all this apparatus, why are we not seeing the full success that language campaigners and government departments wish to see? What do we still need to do in terms of our history to promote Welsh as a co-equal language with English in Wales? Well, of course, in that very sentence, 
I've given you the problem. You have the same issue here. A co-equal land with English, the global language. How is Wales ever going to be co-equal in its reach, in its purchase, in its political domains? It's a struggle, but of course it's a struggle that many of us are convinced we need to be engaged in. So what I've chosen is 10 issues, and I've chosen one example in Wales of each of these levels of intervention to promote language use, and the message is that collectively, they have a cumulative impact well beyond each one of these initiatives, of course. So there's a synergy, there's a trajectory, there's momentum in Wales in the last 20 to 30 years, which is pushing the language into new domains, into new frontiers, into new usage patterns. But of course, that creates its own problems. There's resistance by the majority, there's an unconventional use of Welsh in certain domains, healthcare, the legal system, the media, where people have to begin to expect greater things of the Welsh language. So the language itself, in terms of standardization, grammar, technology, and our speakers together, have to accommodate to these higher expectations. And that's part of the challenge, of course. It's not just about policy, it's also about managing expectations. What are people ambitious about when they want to use Welsh? So these are the first five domains I'll talk about. Family, individual confidence, area-based initiatives, language enterprises, and then urban spaces. And then the other five are initiatives for young people in particular, the future generations, social media, higher education, legal measures, and the current government policy, which was announced in January, to double the numbers of Welsh speakers in one generation. A hugely ambitious policy, which has its strengths and its weaknesses. So these, taken together as a hierarchy, are our attempt to promote language usage. And I'll choose one example from each of these levels to share with you. The most fundamental, of course, is language transmission in the family. TUV in Welsh, T-W-F, means growth. In English, the acronym means transfer within the family. And that's what you have in Wales increasingly, is Welsh words, which means something in Welsh, used in English as a synonym for a programme of action or of um, representation. The TUV experience started in the mid-90s uh, by the Welsh Language Board, and I was a strategist for the Language Board as well as a university professor. Uh, so two days a week I worked in the Language Board promoting Welsh and thinking of new ideas, taking good ideas from Muscardi, Catalonia, Quebec, Friesland, Finland, and trying to apply them in Wales to see whether we could run with the same sort of best practice ideas. The difficulty that many people in Wales have is that unless you're a natural Welsh speaker, a mother tongue Welsh speaker, you don't feel as though you belong to the Welsh language community. There's a them and us historical situation. The minority are very confident, they speak Welsh, they want everybody to speak Welsh. But 80% of the population of Wales don't speak Welsh. Out of 3.2 million people, only about 600,000, 19%, claim to be able to speak Welsh. In non-census surveys, those that are done by the government every few years, a higher portion, some like 700,000, it's reckoned, speak Welsh. So at the most, about 24% of all the people that live in Wales make a claim that they can understand, speak Welsh. Lower levels for reading and writing. So at the maximum, a quarter of the population are able to speak Welsh. What about the three quarters who can't? Well, one message, obviously, which you've taken on board is the majority are important. They're the people you're trying to reach. They're the people who send their children to Icastolas or to uh, Basque for adult education classes. They're the taxpayers. They're the voters. They're the citizens that you live within, amongst, and marry. So the majority are an important target to convince them of coming into the language patterns and usage of Basque and or Welsh. But one of the great things that we tried to do in the 90s 
was to approach bilingualism not from a cultural perspective, as that had been done for three generations, but from a cognitive perspective. And so when mothers-to-be and expectant parents were visited by a doctor or a midwife or a nurse in their home as they, or a clinic, they were given what's called a bounty pack, material about how to bring up children, the health care of children, and in that bounty pack were very well-written arguments for bilingualism, encouraging prospective parents to think of their child's future well-being, not in linguistic, cultural, historical terms, but in value-added terms, in cognitive development, in brain power, in health, in having choices in their lives as they grew up. And this experiment happened in one region of Wales, southwest Wales. Consistent visits by medical personnel, people in authority, who weren't teachers, they weren't language activists, they were doctors, nurses, midwives. And after 18 months of this experiment, there was a 30% increase in enrolment in Welsh medium schools in that big region. So for the first time, people who never thought that they would send their children to Welsh schools started sending their children to Welsh schools. And that program was successful, and it was rolled out throughout the nation. And it argued for educational advantages, both bilingualism and ultimately multilingualism, for economic languages, because if you have two skills, fundamental skills, you can choose different types of employment, it had 19 project workers in its original phase. And then in April 2016, the original contract with the company that ran Tuv was mainstreamed into the government. One of the messages I have is that in the last three years, it's the government which has taken over what were initially community or voluntary or private agencies. So now the policy is being mainstreamed into government departments and paid for, increasingly, by government. That has huge advantages, but as I'll say towards the end, it has some disadvantages, of course. So now what we have is a new system run by the Welsh Nursery School System, Midyad Ysgol and Meithrin, where we have a programme called Camraigi Blant, Welsh for Kids. And this is the sort of modern advertising it does to attract parents who don't speak Welsh to send their children to Welsh-speaking schools, to have faith in the school system. So all sorts of things for mothers and parents, etc. So that's the first initiative, which has been very successful and has been rolled out throughout the system. But it has cumulative effects upstream in the education system in terms of increasing numbers and usage. The second issue is the individual's social psychology. Many people who speak Welsh claim that they are not confident when they use Welsh in public, or in reading, or in writing, or in the employment sector. So they may have Welsh at home, they may be naturally very, very able to communicate and to engage in Welsh, but when it comes to a formal task, working in a government department, sending your tax form back, applying for a passport, doing an interview on television. Lots of people say, my Welsh isn't good enough, because their role model is ministers of religion, university academics, and TV media stars, who are just so natural in three or four languages and are full of confidence. And an average person says, um, yes, I speak Welsh, but well, no, I, I, don't, I don't really want to do an interview. My Welsh isn't good enough. Uh, I'll, I'll do it in English. Well, their English may not be better than their Welsh, but they think it is. And so one initiative we had about uh, for the last 10 years is, your Welsh is great. Whatever the language continuum suggests you're on academically, if you use it and you're encouraged to use it, just go with it. Your language is great. And so this has been very successful because it's overcoming centuries of discrimination and self-hate. Lots of Welsh, I'm sure Basque people, are in the same background. They've been taught for centuries that their language is a peasant language, a language for the farm, for the fishermen. 
but not for high office, not for education, not for public administration, not for the legal system, not for the medical profession. Absolute nonsense. Because until the 20th century, most people in Wales only spoke Welsh. So everything was done in Welsh. The church, the legal system, business transactions, shipbuilding, mining, steelworks, ironworks, railway construction, trade unionism, politics. Up until 1900, all that was done in Welsh. So it's only the last two generations that have undergone this sort of transformation where the state, basically, through education, is saying to them, uh, your language is irrelevant, it's dead. It doesn't exist in modern Britain. And so there's a deep social psychological tension in many Welsh speakers as to how they may represent themselves in public, not in private, but in public. And of course, we know that most bureaucracies are machine-led, they're computer-driven, and until the development of software and Microsoft and Expedia and all those things in Welsh, people were automatically conditioned to use English only, and that obviously generates different patterns of behavior. So the issue was how to increase confidence levels amongst people. And that's been a very successful program. It was a three-year contract originally, done by Yaith Cov, a private company, which is a language planning promotional company. It was so successful that the government took it on board. And since March 2015, the government has a project called Burum Rain. Let's develop together. Let's go forward together to increase the use of the language and confidence in Welsh for adult classes, civil service training, nursery nurse training, medical training, and university training. So increasingly, people who have got one level of Welsh can now increase their level of confidence in using Welsh in all sorts of domains. A third initiative is above the level of the individual family and streets, but below the level of the county. The, there are 22 county authorities in Wales, so it's an area-based initiative, bringing people together there are 14 such initiatives, which is a bit like your program today. Focusing energy on one collective issue and investing in that in a program of action to re-establish language behavior patterns to promote Welsh. So these 14 area-based language initiatives bring together local authorities, universities, colleges, schools, voluntary sectors, sporting clubs, television, everything that happens within that local area, it could be five towns, for example, or a big rural area, coming together to promote Welsh together. Because in the past, we've had individual initiatives, each of which is important, but they don't have a cumulative effect. Because they're all pushing the same message, but in slightly different ways. But by having a much more coordinated initiative to promote Welsh language use, we have a very effective outcome. So the advantage is the initiatives were at a scale greater than the individual community, but the disadvantage was that money talks. The dominant partners were the national government, who promoted this through a programme called Community First, which is worth millions of pounds. It was an anti-poverty programme for deindustrialized areas of Wales to encourage people back to work, to use their Welsh language in the workplace, and to reskill people, having been miners, steel workers, dockers, machinists, factory workers, with the collapse of those heavy industries in Wales in the 1970s and 1980s, there was a high level of male unemployment. And so increasing poverty, no great income coming into the family. So Community First was an attempt to tackle poverty, structural poverty, in a rapidly changing economy. So the national government has invested greatly in this initiative, as have the local governments. The problem is, because they pay the money, they determine the agenda. And there's a tension, I'm sure it'll be here in your group, between what the government is willing to authorise through investment and what the community wants to do for itself, which may not be exactly what the government has in mind. So you've got this tension, structural tension, between the creativity of the community 
and the agenda set by government programs, which are bigger than language, of course, because they're about equality, poverty, reskilling. And you have to navigate language into this community investment program. Then the community itself, the most successful initiative we have is Mentraiaith, Language Enterprise Agencies. In Wales, we have 22 local authorities. Every local authority has one of these agencies. It's the dynamo, which, apart from the education system, is promoting language use. And if you don't know um, much about it, I encourage you to read about it. You may have your own equivalent system. It's a bit like the consorcy in Catalonia, but more organic, less government, much more grounded up. So these are the sort of questions that the Mentraiai, the language enterprise agencies, seek to tackle. How can endangered communities mobilize their own resources? Not government grants, not handouts from government, but their own energy, their own initiative, their own networks from the bottom up, from the ground, from the soil. How can they mobilize those resources and those of government when available as a self-sustaining progress? Not a one-off initiative, which goes away after five years, but as a self-generating tide in favour of Welsh. How do communities engage in the politics of language mobilisation without alienating the very people in whose name they claim to act? If they go too far, if they're too extreme in one level, the people say, well, nothing to do with me. I don't belong to that political party. I don't belong to that political movement. Uh, they don't take me with them. So you have to have a very, very sensitive needs-based analysis of what local people actually say they want for their children, for themselves, in terms of Welsh. So it could be things like sporting activities. It could be playing football. It could be sailing. It could be drama. It could be business skills. It could be where women have had two or three children and have been out of the labour market for ten years. They want to go back into the labour market but don't have the confident skills to use the computing system in Welsh. So we have mobile vans, basically, which go around different communities, and two afternoons a week, anybody who wants to, free, can go into this van. There are 20 stations with computer um, tutors teaching people new skills of computing in Welsh. So you've got a double advantage for females returning to work. They're learning new skills, but they're learning it in Welsh, and so they can apply for any job that's relevant to their new skills. It came from the community, it was funded by the community with some government money, or it could be that the community wants to develop tourism, or it wants to develop closer links with Ireland in the west of Wales and north of Wales. So the Mentraiaith have freedom to be creative. But all too often, the best ideas from this organic level community become embroiled in bureaucracy. If they want to be really successful, they want to grow. Well, to grow, they have to go beyond the community and draw down money either from banks or insurance companies or television companies or, more likely, from the local authority and the government. And then the difficulty becomes bureaucracy kicks in. And the temptation is for bureaucracy to say, you'll have the money on condition that you do this, this, and this. And some communities are very happy with that. Others say, well, we're not government civil servants. We're not public agents. We're a strong local community that wants to do our own thing. We just want half a million euros to do it better. And the government says, yes, we'll consider that. But you must do this, this, and this, because this is our national set of priorities. And as you immediately see, there's a tension between the creativity, the ambiguous sometimes creativity of community, and what the government is willing to fund. It's inevitable, but it exists and it has to be tackled. Then the higher level is the Welsh Language Board itself in terms of its strategy. Nearly all of its policies are evidence-based. I was saying yesterday to your colleagues, what I admire most about the Basque system, right from the very beginning, is that you developed a statistical basis for language planning. You did time series data analysis of different trajectories, of different ways in which Basque was being used by domain, by region, and by locality. 
And then you propose that this is a continuous process and you publish the results. So at least the general public, as well as your language policy experts, have a statistical basis on which to make judgments. This is what the Language Board also did from 1994 until its demise in 2012. So it identified the main threats based on data, not on hearsay or political propaganda, but on actual behavioral change. Then it discussed with different government authorities ways in which language initiatives could be coordinated to make most use of people's energy and resources. Then it sought to promote cooperation. I understand that this is an important program that you're engaged in now because it brings together all the actors in a common trajectory, in a common momentum. This is what the board sought to do from the mid-90s onwards, to galvanize, to energize people in one forward progressive movement. So it established local language fora where people came together to discuss what do we need in our community for the promotion of Welsh outside the school? How are we going to achieve this goal? How are we going to articulate it? And what that does, of course, it empowers local people. It is democracy in action. It's not a government telling people how to behave or what to do. It's allowing space for local initiatives at the county level to grow, to develop, to experiment, sometimes to fail, but by and large, to give people some sense of power and responsibility for their own language. Governments don't save languages. People do in daily usage. The sheer test of a language relevance is what happens in a hospital bedside table, or what happens at home, or what happens in the playground, or what happens in the community. Not what politicians say should happen, but what really happens at the local level of contact with other people. And so this whole progress has been about community empowerment, people empowerment through democratic representation. So the mentor, the language enterprise agency, is defined in this way. I'll lead you to... So it's public, it's business, it's leisure activities, it's whatever the language can be used for is supported And together, it has taken a social transformation in the use of Welsh into new domains, into hitherto underdeveloped areas of language use. There are 22 enterprises in Wales, and there's one in Patagonia, in Argentina, where people in the mid-19th century emigrated from Wales to Tre Rosen, to Uscala, and to Puerto Madryn, right in the Chibut, right in the very south of, Patag of Argentina. Uh, there's a Welsh... Ironically, for English-speaking Welsh people, a Welsh-Spanish bilingual community. Uh, I went there uh, to develop links between the university and Cardiff, and it was surreal to hear Welsh people speaking Spanish and not English. Uh, you're used to Welsh being in the context of English, but then Spanish was the dominant language. Uh, so there's a mentoriaeth, a language enterprise agency, in Patagonia as well, which encourages local schools and local enterprise and tourism, whale watchers, American tourists, etc., but ultimately, they're language planning bodies. Not government departments, but local language planning agencies. They're evaluated and they're reviewed periodically. The last one, which a man called Jeremy Ivas and I did from the Department of Welsh in Cardiff, argued that their best recommendation was to have a national coordinating body to make most use of the best practice that have been developed, and to give them long-term budgets. What the government had done was give them annual budgets. And if they met their targets, they were given more money next year. Well, of course, that's okay from a government point of view. But if you want to develop a career as an animateur, as a language activist, you want security of employment. You want to develop programs for five and ten years. You don't want to think that all your ideas come to an end in two years' time if the government cuts the funding. So what the government did to respond to our recommendation was to guarantee five-year funding, which transformed the ability of these men to try to attract young, good people and to develop medium-term programs of action that they knew they could guarantee to fund 
and resource. Then a fifth area is urban spaces. Places in towns where Welsh speakers and particularly adult Welsh people who've learned Welsh and are not so confident in their use of Welsh in the general street can go to what we call safe spaces to use their Welsh either for discussion groups, for entertainment, for concerts, for planning future developments. They are a one-stop shop for all language, language services, services in Welsh in towns. And they are very successful, and it's a whole range of them now. And they're particularly important because as soon as you walk in through the door, everything that happens in that space is Welsh. That may sound un unconvincing to you, but because English is so dominant, if there are two Welsh people and an English person walks into the conversation, it used to be that the language switched to English. Now Welsh people keep on speaking Welsh. But all urban spaces in Britain are obviously dominant English. So where do you go to use your Welsh once you've learnt it, to practice it and to rehearse your new skills? Well, these new centres provide a one-stop shop for services, information, but they also provide entertainment and social activities for adults who want to use their Welsh in the modern world. And then for young people, there are a huge number of initiatives. It's a very dynamic cultural mood in Wales. <clears throat> Things like you might expect here, of course, a pop scene, television, theatres, drama, huge numbers of initiatives, particularly in small towns and rural areas, places where metropolitan London programmes don't reach. People are helping themselves and are very creative. And the most important part of this is the bottom one. We have national and local cultural competitions in Wales called Eistedd Vodai. They're competitive, high level, they're not professional, but they're a professional standard. Speaking, dancing, playing instruments, performing, mixed choirs, single choirs, females, males, all sorts of activities uh, which are significant. And this would be an example of the National Eisteddfod, which is held for a week in a different location in Wales in August. And most of the people who are trained for this are just normal people. But from this training emerges many of the stars of the Welsh classical music scene, the national orchestra, the television, and those television people often go on to British or international television because they've gained confidence and usage in formal competitive competitions, local, county, regional, and nationally established. From about May to August, we have a whole series of competitions. And so children are taught to be confident, to be on a stage like I am now. From the age of five, I've always been on a stage. I'm not unusual. My schooling gave me confidence to be a performer. And the argument would be, if you were no good, we wouldn't ask you. Well, usually children are very tense, they're nervous, they don't want to perform. But by doing this almost regularly as part of their school curriculum activity, they gain confidence in using Welsh in public and their musical, dramatic and theatrical skills. It's also a chance for young people to meet on a campsite for a week, etc., and get to know permanent friends who in adulthood obviously become very important. Then the media is a huge. Next to London, Wales has the largest media concentration in Britain. In five locations in Wales, mainly in Cardiff, but not only in Cardiff. And this media is Welsh origin, but also serves an English international audience. So you might train as a Welsh medium cameraman, or a Welsh medium television presenter, or a children's activist. But in time, your career takes off and you become a regular on BBC or CBC or Australian Broadcasting. In other words, it nurtures talent and gives people an opportunity to develop all sorts of skills in front of the camera and behind the camera in all sorts of social media to be creative. And of course, they're highly paid professional jobs as well. <coughs> so it pays to be proficient in Welsh if you are in the media, whether it be radio, television, or increasingly films and radio stations. So, 
Compared to lots of other minorities, Welsh has a relatively well-developed media and IT social media capacity. It has government-backed language technology centres which feed new patterns, new words, new systematic ways of approaching at the University of Bangor in North Wales. And there's a well-developed, sustained corpus of work on the use of Welsh in new social media activities. <coughs> then the eighth level is the legal measures which the Government of Wales now has taken to promote the use of Welsh in new domains, in new areas. <coughs> the Welsh Language Board was abolished in March 2012 and taken in to government as a Welsh language unit, a Welsh language division. Its regulatory arm was established as the Welsh Language Commissioner's Office to regulate the use of Welsh. One of the most important things the Commissioner did two years ago was to establish the absolute right of Welsh people to use Welsh in their workplace, regardless of what the company policy is. Now, for the first time, if a group of workers want to use Welsh in the workplace for part of their activities, they have a legally sanctioned right to do that. That's a huge transformation in the economy of Wales. It used to be that Welsh was used in the public administration, in hospitals, in universities. But the private sector now, if the workers themselves decide they want to use Welsh in a factory, or in a high-tech business, and the bosses resist, they can appeal to the commissioner to intervene, <coughs> to investigate, and to guarantee their rights. And the message is, what's the point of training whole generations of people to use their Welsh language skills at a high level of proficiency, if as soon as they step into the workplace, they're stopped from using Welsh? It's irrational, it's illogical. You manage people's expectations by saying Welsh is an important skill, but they can't earn their living using Welsh in the private sector. So this new commissioner's intervention has radically transformed the potential for the use of Welsh in the private sector. And gradually we're seeing it rolled out into banks, insurance companies, factories, high-tech, scientific um, industries, etc. Not as the language of work, but as an integral part of the workplace language. Okay? So, coming towards the end then, this is the National Assembly for Wales, the Parliament. Despite its initial success, the government is minded to abolish the Commissioner's Office and change it to a commission with four units. Language promotion and use, regulation, IT, and language planning. Why? Because they want innovation to lead to behavioural change. And by having disparate, separate agencies doing different things with the language, the government believes that it's not having the desired cumulative impact to change people's behaviour. So it wants one strong department at the heart of government, a commission for the Welsh language, which will be established next year, to harness all these energies to produce behavioural change. I and others advise the government, this is our thinking. We want not rights and duties, we want behavioural change. The reason being, until recently, government plan was about outputs. How much money do you spend on education? How many targets have you met? How much people are involved in certain programmes? Excellent ideas. But there was no evaluation of outcomes. What, as a result of all this spending and energy and political propaganda, has changed people's linguistic <coughs> behaviour and usage? And so this new commission is designed with one sole message, promoting the actual use of Welsh and changing people's behavioural patterns. So this is the Prime Minister, Calvin Jones. At the Nationalist level two years ago, he announced, amongst all the druids, the fanfare, that there would be a new ambition to create a million speakers of Welsh in one generation. Double the number of people now. Inevitably, it's the education system that is going to produce these people. So I'm going to ask some questions. How feasible is the target? How are these six new areas of attention 
going to develop a million speakers, to get a million speakers, of course, in Wales in 2050, you need 1.4 million speakers being trained. There's many people who move to England, or Australia, or Europe, or America. So to have a resident of a million people, you need to produce something like 1.4 million, which is a huge change compared to the numbers today. It's a huge challenge and risk for the government. Who will the speakers be? How will they be defined in 30 years' time? Are the targets feasible? If they're not met, does it really matter? What really matters is the actual usage of Welsh. Not whether you have 900,000, 1 million or 1.2 million, but the actual robust usage of Welsh as a default lingua propria. Education is the growth, of course. But there are unknown consequences, and for the last four minutes, I'll speak about this. Language use in many domains is not as encouraging as propaganda suggests. When you drill down to what actually people do do, it's not as <coughs> successful as the programs argue. Well speaking communities continue to weaken. They become urbanized. There's long patterns of migration from England or the rest of Europe into rural, attractive, well speaking mm -hmm. areas. There's a great debate about the uncertainty of Brexit. Until recently, we argued that bilingualism and multilingualism in Wales was a Welsh version of a common European trend increased multilingualism. If you reduce the European element in the British political discourse, it goes back to the old model. English is dominant, Welsh is weak. It becomes a bilingual, not a multilingual debate. So there are many challenges and threats posed by Brexit. Other outstanding issues which I'm sure you share, the socioeconomic development of the Welsh language is critical. People need to be able to use the language to earn a living. That's where it pays to have Welsh language skills. It's not political manipulation, it's not cultural attachment, it's not tribal loyalty. It's the pay packet which will win the argument for people to develop their language skills as they grow through adulthood. The role of the majority is critical. And there's a word of warning, not for you, but for our own background. Promoting a political sensitive language like Welsh or Basque or Catalan is a political issue, of course, but it should not be a self-serving exercise in expediency what suits the government today or cynicism. We'll throw money at it and hope it goes away. So it depends which government you have in power, of course, in each of these nations. So in conclusion, Initiatives have reflected good ideas and best practice. Many have achieved the goals, but some have been fragmented and suffered from short-term planning, one-year, two-year funding, not long-term commitments. That is beginning to change, and I'm glad it is, because now people can have more confidence in actual language planning. If I may make a note, language policy and planning has been about language. It hasn't really been about planning for the long term. It's been about planning for the short term, whatever governments allow for five years. But to revitalize the language, of course, you need generational change. You need to plan for the next two or three generations and promise, through political conviction, a systematic support for those programs in the long term, well beyond the life of the original government or the language planning team. And the most important message, I think, is outcomes, not outputs. We want, through your programme, of course, here, to change people's default behaviour. Not once, not twice, but systematically embedded into their psyche, into their default usage of the language. So successful interventionist campaigns can work. They worked in healthcare, in sugar tax, in plastics, in environmental concern, in drink driving. You can intervene to change people's behavior. But are language policies different 
from mainstream health policies. Is there something particular and peculiar about the struggle of a minority language to navigate itself into the mainstream so that it becomes a public good that all can share in that society, whether or not they speak Basque or Catalan or Welsh? And if there is, we need to be much more professional in our development and implementation of policy when it concerns language, as opposed to something like healthcare, which everybody shares. We need to be super intelligent in the way in which we produce messages and convince people that it's in their own interest to see the promotion of Basque, whether or not they want to use it themselves at the moment, because their children may do, or their neighbors may do. So these are the priorities I'll close with. The focus on changing behavior and inducing good habits that you have somehow have to be embedded in society. Not just initiatives floating here of the faithful and the convicted and the articulate and the animateurs, because that's just preaching to ourselves. We have to embed our language behavioral aims in the deep structures of society. It takes time, it takes conviction, it takes articulation, but it also takes patience. And then otherwise, if we don't, if we run out of patience, if we say we've tried that and it didn't work in the short term, it becomes an expedience. It becomes a government short-term campaign. And the difficulty, of course, of all that is that governments set the frame and they fund, but they don't control. We, the people, control the development of our own language. And if we're not convinced in our own hearts and minds that to promote Basque is the absolute necessity for its future, we're wasting people's time. So that's why I asked at the very beginning, what do you expect from your program? And do you have faith that it will work? Because if you have faith, just like an evangelical gospel message, if you're convinced, others will be convinced, not by what you say, but by how you behave and what you do. Because it's by your words that people listen, but it's by your actions that people are convinced. So I hope and pray that your initiative will be successful for this year, but also for the next 30 to 50 years, so that together, each time you attempt this, it will have a cumulative impact. And that you won't be disappointed if the results are inconsistent or are not perfect. That's human nature. You should expect inconsistency. Why? Because individuals are autonomous. There is such a thing as society, but there is also such a thing as individual human decision-making. Governments don't control the soul and the heart. But together, you can win if you have faith in your own program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Esanda dago beraz, zuen txanda da, eta baita ere, momentu honetan, zuen txanda da, nahi izan eskero, galderak egiteko gure konbidatuari. Mikrofonoa eskuan bertan bada galdera bat, egin nahia, berak entzun egingo du eta itzuli egingo diote, beraz nahi duzuen izkuntzan egin dezakezu, egaz euskera zala ingeles ez nahi izan eskero. Of course. Bai, egunon. Mila esker eta zorionak egindako ibilbidearen gaitxik. Oso zaila da zuen egoera eta animoak aurrera egiteko. Guk ezagutzen dugu oso ondo zaila den bi izkuntza erraldo inguratuta zaudenean izkuntza gutxitu baten aldeko lan egitea eta zuek bereziki mehatxu oso potoloa duzu ez gaur egun ingeleza erraldo joietan lehenen goetarikoa da, ez? Galdera zehatz bat, egin nahi dizut, ez da igual justo itzaldiaren muinetakoa, baina da gai txiki bat, baina guretzako garrantzitsua neurri baten. Aipatu duzu, nola emandako aurrera pausoen artean, ezarri den galezera itzegiteko eskubidea, galezera erabiltzeko eskubidea lanean. Eee... 
Zalantza pare bat. Hori modu universalean ezarri duzue, berez langile batek aldarrikatu aldu berak galezera erabiltzea bere lanean naiz eta ingurukoek bera ez ulertu? Zuk lanean idatzi bat egin behar baduzu eta idatzi hori zuzenduta badago beste lankide bati zeinek ez duen galezera ulertzen, hor bitartekoa jarri behar dira, berak eskubidea du horrela egiteko, gero langile horrek ez erakunde barruko baizik eta kanpoko erritarrekin harremana badu haien autura moldatu behar du bere jarrera edo berak mantendu aldu bere autua galesera erabiltzeko eta horrekin lotuta enpresa pribatuetan agian ez baina erakunde publikoetan suposatzen dut neurriak hartzen direnean agian galeseraren alde ezarriko dala batzuetan izkuntza, osea, lana ze izkuntzatan egin, zein dan lan izkuntza. Osea, erakundeek badute behartzea galesera ezagutzen duten langileei beraien lana galeseraz burutzeko? Well, if we start with the last part of your comment, Public authorities, local authorities, particularly in the north and the west of Wales, uh, Carnarvon, Anglesey, Cardigan, Carmarthen, Pembrokeshire, their dominant working language is Welsh. All government local authorities in that north and west of Wales use Welsh as the first language of work. And they communicate to other counties in Wales and to the police, the fire, the ambulance, the national government in Welsh. So, yes, public authorities politically have the right to use Welsh as the dominant language. The private sector is very fragmented. Um, small and medium-sized enterprises, those that have less than 50 people, particularly if they work in agriculture, in food, in tourism, the dominant language for many of these companies is Welsh. Internally. Externally, it may be bilingual communication, or if they're really exporting their produce, of course, it'll be in French or Spanish or English. Welsh will not be used outside Wales. The real difficulty is that until recently, if a large number of people wanted to use Welsh to converse with each other in the workplace or to set up some of their responsibilities in Welsh, the bosses whoever they were, could forbid them from using Welsh in the workplace. The commissioner intervened and established the right to use Welsh in the workplace. How much it's used is then a matter of negotiation in the workplace. So one lone individual won't get very far using Welsh and not English in any private company. That would just be ridiculous. But a group of workers in a unit of a big insurance company or a bank or a hospital have, do, and can use Welsh as their natural language of work. When it comes to recording the decisions or sending the reports to another unit or to a higher level, they're either typically bilingual, or if it's a medical profession, they typically are in English only, because the notes with the patient may be in Welsh, but for the next level of investigation of, say, breast cancer, or brain tumour, or surgery, by definition, most of the doctors aren't even Welsh, let alone Welsh-speaking. They're from Pakistan, Bangladesh, Germany, Canada. And so each conditional use of Welsh is context-bound. There's no universal law or regulation that I can give you. But what the Commissioner's investigation and intervention has done is established a platform, and in future, as more and more people go through Welsh medium education, um, I expect something like 40% of all young people in Wales in this generation to be completely bilingual. And as they come into the workforce, they just choose English and Welsh together as a natural choice. When I was in school, I went to the only bilingual high school in Wales in 1963, 23 children. Now there's about 167,000 children in the same starting year 
going year by year. So as the education system improves, you can expect the language to be used much more in the private sector because of customer demand and staff proficiency in using Welsh. Eskerrik asko, ez dakit galdera gehiagorik badagoen, ala bada mesere zaltxa eskua. Uste dut ezetz, argiek ez dute oso ondo ikusten uzten. Ez dago besterik, beraz, txalo haundi bat emango diogu, agurrezateko eta eskerrak emateko, gure gombidatuari. Ok, txalo haundi bat emango diogu, agurrezateko eta eskerrak emateko, gure gombidatuari.